I would suspect that this will be worse than the 2008 crisis. Uh, I don't think it'll be a Great Depression. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, May 10th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, May 10th, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Look in, everyone. It's time for another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Some housekeeping, if you are new to this channel or you have not already done so, please do subscribe to be notified on new updates and give us a thumbs up if you like what we do. Our guest today is Jeff Deist, president of the Mises Institute, who serves as a writer, public speaker, advocate for property markets and civil society. Jeff is an interesting guy in that besides being the president of the Mises Institute, he has spent many years as a tax attorney advising private equity clients on mergers and acquisitions. But what is also interesting about Jeff is that he worked as a longtime advisor and chief of staff to Congressman Ron Paul. Jeff likes sound money and he likes reducing the size and scope of government and has worked with countless grassroots activists. It's time to saddle up and silver up with Mises Institute President Jeff Deist. Jeff, welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Great. We're glad you could you could make it back. A lot of talk about since the uh, since the last time you you were here, Jeff. Let's start by you sharing your thoughts on how our normal world was turned upside down crazy fast as a result of this pandemic with travel restrictions, closing of businesses, and lockdowns. It was fast. We haven't seen these kind of uh, border shutdowns and sort of uh, nationalist impulses really since the end of World War I. It's been uh, a long, long time since we've seen something like this. And it's really shaken, I think, a lot of people's belief in the international order. I think there's some upside to that. I think there's some downside to that. It, it depends. I, I do think a lot of the institutions uh, which uh, pretend to uh, oversee us have been exposed for what they are, which is basically incompetent or corrupt. But I also think that uh, our overall response as a society to the virus has been overhyped. I think it's been uh, too dramatic. And I'd like to see the world sort of readjust as a result of this, have maybe a little bit less faith in bureaucratic institutions, a little less faith in government, and a little more faith in markets and human ingenuity. Because I, I think that we're going to find that uh, the former didn't work so well and the latter are actually providing the solutions. Okay. Um, something caught my ear. You, you said... Uh pretend to oversee us which which organizations <laughs> which organizations might might those be who might they be well i mean you look at something like the world health organization which presumably would effectively be the boss of a pandemic and would be issuing maybe not legal orders but certainly guidelines to national governments and we haven't seen that we've really seen the who's credibility question and we've seen governments just fall into their own policies we've seen a huge amount of federalism or subsidiarity in the sense that even within, let's say, the European Union, uh, Italy and Germany aren't talking to each other. They're not comparing notes on how to approach it. There's no uh, one size fits all EU approach. And so each country has sort of reverted to its own nationalist policies. And in the United States, we've seen the various 50 states uh, ha have some differences in how they've approached this. So uh, it, it's been a challenge for centralized governments and even supranational NGO type organizations like the UN or the WHO, because, you know, it, when when things get bad in a country, things also get local. Every crisis is local at the end of the day, because, you know, how you obtain food and water, how you obtain shelter, how you obtain medical care, who you interact with, how you get groceries, all of these things are hyper local at the end of the day. And uh, if, if Brussels can't help you with that, if the UN and New York can't help you with that, you're you're probably going to ignore them, at least in the short term. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, is managing a pandemic one of the responsibilities of, of government? You know, I guess it arguably is in the sense of life, liberty, happiness. We want, you know, governments are supposed to protect our lives and our property. Uh, but I think the First and foremost role of government, if we're going to have it, 
is to give us accurate information, just to provide us with data that it's difficult for us to go obtain maybe on our own or privately or even for a state governor to obtain comparative data across countries across the globe. I think, um, you know, open, honest communication is the best we can hope for from national governments in this kind of situation. We don't want them lying to us. We don't want them overhyping things. And we especially don't want them making uh, far-reaching decisions based on really incomplete and oftentimes flawed data. And that's what we've seen. I mean, shutdowns in a global economy are not uh, just, you know, a three-day weekend or something. I mean, these are, these are things that have uh, a, a, an effect like throwing a stone in a pond, a ripple effect that spreads out across the globe. And so you can't just shut down, uh, let's say, certain manufacturing capability in areas of China that were particularly affected and expect that not to have an effect on American consumers and then American producers and so forth. And so you you shut down uh, most of, of the, the world, really, at least the developed world, and cease all business activity. And that's going to have dramatic effects for a long time. And I think that we should have had uh, maybe better data and we should have had more market approaches to this. I think that we could have remained open with uh, more aggressive quarantining of older people. Uh, let younger people under 30 pretty much, uh, you know, operate facilities where, you know, in high risk areas. Uh, you could have taken a middle approach for people, let's say, between 30 and, and elderly years. Uh, you could have done, as we've seen in Taiwan, and I believe also in Singapore, you could have done on the spot uh, testing of people's temperatures. Uh, it, 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 there's still some some question about how well masks work, but there's some anecdotal evidence that they do. We could have had uh, a, a lot of different approaches short of just an on off switch. And, you know, governments are not good at uh, delicate operations. They tend to have a sledgehammer approach to things. And so that that scares me. Uh, it makes me worried that maybe we've risked plunging the, the West anyway uh, into Great Depression Part Two over a, a virus, which is starting to look like it's only slightly more lethal and slightly more transmittable than ordinary flu. So we're going to see um, if if a lot of people, you know, if we're going to try to have to rewrite history and so, well, no, it was justified because we had to save lives. It might cost more lives. Just to expand on this a bit more, is it justified for the government to impose these travel restrictions on individuals, the closing of workplaces and, and telling people what they can or cannot do in the context of minimizing the spread of virus? I know you mentioned maybe certain things for certain age groups, but, but is it justified for government to do this? Well, depending on the outlook, I would say it's not justified absent so, at least some amount of due process. Uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano has written about this. What would due process look like at a bare minimum if you were going to uh, force someone into quarantine, if you were going to force someone to shut their business, if you were going to force someone not to get in their car or get on an airplane? Uh, that would require, at a minimum, some sort of hearing. Uh, the, the government would have to identify a particular person. They'd have to identify a particular risk that person or that business posed. And presumably that would be require some sort of showing that they had the virus or whatever it might be, or that if it was a business that they were a nexus or a vector spot for a lot of people to transmit the virus. And, and then the, uh, the business or individual would have to have a chance to respond at that hearing. How do you do that across a society in, in the United States of 320 million people? I'm not sure, but unless and until we're willing to rewrite the rules, due process still applies in a crisis. And, um, you know, so I would argue that as, as a legal matter, no. And as a practical matter, markets and individuals and, and uh, localities can do better than one size fits all policies. I, I mean, why do we have the same rules, the same shelter in place or quarantine effect in Manhattan, which is densely populated, that we have in South Dakota, which is one of the least densely populated places in the United States with very few cases. So, um, you know, it's, it's a very difficult question. There's no easy or perfect answer, but I think the closer to the ground you get, the more localized you get, the, the better the approach. Okay. Do you see the shutdowns? as a, a, a choice that was made to minimize death and protect life over the economy? Sure. I, I mean, I think the, the various governors, for example, in the United States are, are certainly well-intentioned. They were freaked out. They were worried about their people. They didn't want to have a bunch of deaths in their state. And 
Probably they also didn't want to be seen as a, politically as a failed governor who allowed this. Uh, so there's a lot of political pressure to overreact um, because, you know, you, nobody blames the governor for saving people because you can see that right in front of you. Uh, it, what's not so easy to see is all the destruction and death and hardship and depression and bankruptcy and divorce that's going to be caused uh, by the shutdown. So that's a little harder to see. So I do think that uh, the efforts behind the shutdown were well-intentioned, at least at first. I think there is a lot of effort now to paint this uh, into uh, uh, or, or to portray this in tribal terms, to go back to our teams, our red state and blue state mentality. And I think there's a lot of pressure now politically and otherwise on the left to keep this thing going, to hurt Trump that there's a lot of politics behind it and people want the shutdown to continue so that life is abnormal. And, and you know, there, uh, there are people dying. There's uh, huge dislocations in the economy. The stock market's in the tank and that all of this will hurt Trump. So there's certainly a political element to this. I mean, there, you know, we, we shouldn't kid ourselves about that. But I wouldn't ascribe sinister motives to any of the shutdowns, at least not initially. Okay, so we, we've seen the, uh, the government side of the coin. How about the uh, people side of the coin? What do you think of people who say, it's my body, it's my choice. If I'm sick, I'm sick, as the reason why they are resisting shutdowns and social distancing measures. Do you think that they are counting the real costs of our actions correctly? Well, it's still unfolding, so we can't know. We're going to need probably another year, who knows. But I think people would have done this voluntarily. I think a lot of people would have self-quarantined just by based on the data they were getting from their own social media or newspapers or whatever it might be without government involvement. I think a lot of business businesses would have sent people home and, and figured out work from home arrangements. And that would probably be relaxed about now. Um, I think a lot of uh, restaurants would have suffered. I think a lot of uh, venues, concerts and the, and the like might have suffered from attendance, but there would be an, a certain percentage of the population that would attend anyway or go out to eat anyway. And I think that's all OK. I, I don't think that a free society shuts people down uh, using government force or, or law or executive order, or edicts, however you want to put it, uh, on, a, on a mere potentiality of harm. Uh, you know, I think that there's a choice. There's no utopian solution, but I think there's a choice whether we want to live in a freer society with the risks which that entails or if we want to live in a more closed society. Um, you know, in China, for example, it was a lot pl easier politically to affect a widespread shutdown. Uh, people in China are a, a little more accustomed to authoritarian measures from their governments, and their government is a little more accustomed to, I mean, literally grabbing people in the streets, uh, beating them, imprisoning them, locking them into their homes. I mean, this is a little more accepted in some societies than it is in the West. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a good thing for the West. We ought to keep it that way. And um, if, if that means that we have more deaths uh, as a result of this virus, that's a sad thing. But I would still accept that just as I would still accept during, uh, you know, a bad flu season that people still go out to work and that they still go to restaurants. And, and as a result of that, you know, they might get infected with the virus and some people might die. I mean, this is part of life. Uh, viruses are nothing new. And uh, I think most of what government does actually harms the private sector's ability to respond to virus. You know, obviously, we've heard a lot of stories about FDA and regulation and capacity in hospitals and all kinds of rules and regulations which are involved. That's kind of a separate subject. But, um, you know, I, I think I think society could handle this. I think technology could handle this. I think markets could handle this. It just couldn't handle it perfectly because life's not perfect. And if you want zero deaths, uh, you're going to have to shut everybody down forever. Because at some point, if we emerge on the other side, the virus is still there and people have to go out. You mentioned China. Given that this virus was first detected in China, what do you think of the, the ideas that's been floating around where, where some are calling for China to pay the financial cost of the countries that have been affected by the pandemic? Yeah, it's an interesting argument. The, it certainly excites the right here in the U.S., um, but you have to distinguish the Chinese, the Chinese people from the Chinese government, just like any country. I mean, the Chinese people are just like us. They get up in the morning. They're worried about their bills. They're worried about their kids, whatever it is. 
Uh, they're not responsible for the crazy actions of their government. I, I don't feel personally responsible for the crazy actions of my government. Um, and so, you know, this idea that we're going to apply sanctions to them or something, I, I think this whole thing has been very bad for China. Their reputation on the international stage, uh, their, their business interests as a manufacturing outpost uh, for Western businesses, I think, is harmed. Uh, their role in the global supply chain and distribution network is, is probably going to be reduced. There's going to be a lot of anti-China sentiment. And so I don't, I don't agree with piling on with some sort of state action sanctions or, or uh, you know, the last thing we need to do is harm the Chinese people economically now with sanctions or fines or something like that. They're going to be digging out of this uh, and already suffering from manufacturing slowdown. So I, I don't agree with that. And we have to remember that sanctions, sanctions really hurt people. I mean, they hurt them economically. And ultimately, that means people are poor, which means they have uh, worse public health. It means they have worse food. It means they have worse habitations over their heads. So, you know, I don't I, I see that as just a, a halfway active war. And I don't want to go to war with China, with the Chinese government or the Chinese people. Yeah, I hear you. Totally agree with that. Um, let's talk about the, the real economy for a bit. You know, the, the consequences of shutting down the U.S. economy, and, and we touched on this a, a little, they have um, affected people and, and businesses so far in a way where we've seen some businesses go bankrupt. Uh, we've seen people who are, are looking to, to get that $1,200 check, living, to, living from paycheck to paycheck. In your area, uh, which would be Alabama, how are the people and businesses doing there? Not well. Uh, restaurants, are, some restaurants are making a third uh, based on carryout takeaway orders. Uh, maybe a third of what they were used to, but that even that's only you know certain types of restaurants, not fancy or sit down places or whatever. Uh, so the, I happen to live in a university town, and the thirty thousand students here just never came back from spring break, which is very very strange. And so the seventy five thousand people population here, um, you know, because we're a smaller state, a less densely populated state, we haven't had as many deaths, and we haven't felt. Uh, as much of a crisis as people have in New York and New Jersey in particular. But there's still, uh, I think, a lot of economic damage. There's a lot of rents not being paid, uh, a lot of mortgages not being paid. And, and I don't know whether a lot of these little restaurants and a lot of these little shops, which aren't chains, are going to come back on the other side of this. You think the economy will get back to what it was or forever changed? I don't think it will in a year. I don't I don't believe in this idea of a V-shaped recovery uh, or that there's all this pent up demand. I mean, you can have pent up demand for, let's say, a haircut <laughs> because your hair is getting long, but you would, might have had two or three haircuts in the interim if things have been normal. So the, the barber never gets back the money from those two or three haircuts. Same with going out to eat. You know, you, you, you don't go out to eat and have five dinners. <laughs> you go out to eat and have one. Um, I think there will be some pent up demand uh, amongst the luckier folks who have kept their jobs uh, for you know travel. I think some people are going to want to go to an island or something uh, and just feel a sense of normalcy. I think some people are going to want to go out to eat. But you know what we're talking about is unemployment in the United States on a par as a per cap on a per capita basis like we haven't seen since the Great Depression. So that's not something you just flip a switch and get back. I would suspect that this will be worse than the, the, the 2008 crisis and recession. Uh, I don't think it'll be a Great Depression. Um, I think at least for those of us who are fortunate enough to live in, in, in Western countries, uh, the economist Robert Higgs talks about the capacity we have, we have here. So even if the dollar is in the toilet, which won't be, and then the banks are in trouble. You know, there's still a lot of physical and now technological capital in advanced countries like the United States. We have a lot of distribution centers. We have a lot, have a lot of manufacturing capacity. We have a lot of software and high tech and hardware uh, capabilities. So, you know, that doesn't that doesn't just disappear in a recession. It doesn't magically go poof. So. Um, I don't think we'll be starving. I think a lot of Americans will be using food stamps more than ever. 
Um, you know, I, I read your introduction to a Mises Institute ebook called Anatomy of the Crash. Can you share with us how how brazen was the Fed's response to the coronavirus to the point where it even confused the financial press? It's almost beyond belief. I don't think that monetary policy so-called exists anymore. I think central banks, especially the U.S. Fed and the ECB and the Bank of Japan, uh, have just become almost wishful thinking. They become these ad hoc credit facilities that just exist to, to create liquidity. This is the word, the buzzword we keep hearing from central bankers, liquidity, liquidity. What does that mean? Liquidity just means ready money, spendable money. So where's that coming from? Well, it's not coming from the economy producing goods and services because everybody's at home. I mean, so it's clearly being conjured up out of thin air and the technical details of how that conjuring takes place and then where the money goes, those are two very interesting questions unto themselves, albeit complicated questions. But we do know that from, from history, and, and we're going to see this again, that most of the money tends to go into the financialized end of the economy rather than into the hands of the poorest people. I'd like to see the uh, shareholder class take the haircut, not the poorest people take the haircut. So, you know, I, I, I can't even pretend to understand what the Fed is doing, and, and no, neither can anybody else. It, it's, it's day to day. Uh, any comment you make could be uh, obsolete in a week as they announce some new credit facility. They're not just giving money in buying assets in the form of treasury debt or mortgage-backed securities from commercial banks like they did in 08. This time they are buying uh, bonds through, e they're buying corporate bond debt through ETFs. They're buying municipal debt all the way down to smaller cities even. Uh, they are buying debt, which is backed by credit cards and student loans. So they're doing things which are very different from 2008. Uh, it's it's bizarre. Uh, I I don't I don't know what the end game is. I don't think they do either. I don't think there's a plan. I think they are just scrambling around trying to do whatever they can to prop up employment and stock markets for another day, another week, another month. And um, I think this is going to be much like we were discussing the WHO at the beginning of the show. This is going to be the, uh, you know, more of the death of expertise. Hey, I've been I've been wondering about this, and I'll, I'll ask you. Um, my understanding is the Fed cannot um, fund or or disperse or or give out money unless it has some type of collateral. Do you think it'll get to a point where the government may have to actually nationalize natural resources and use that as collateral to get funding from the Fed? There's a ton of people out there uh, making guesses about this and what this might look like, because you're right. There are requirements in the Federal Reserve Act itself as amended that requires the central bank to receive collateral. And sometimes that collateral uh, pretty shaky. I mean, if the mortgage backed security debt that they were buying back in 2008, if that had been marked to market, <laughs> yeah, it would have been worth a lot less than its book value. So. But yet the, the bank from whom it was being purchased got full book value uh, in terms of reserves at the Fed. So that's a little shady. Let, let's just call it what it is, a little shady. But now you've got the bank getting all other kinds of assets and, and what backs them up? I mean, what if they buy uh, municipal bond debt and then later on that municipality declares bankruptcy? Uh, you, you know, I mean, what does the Fed have on its balance sheet? So. There, there's a lot of, I think, support for and pressure, as sad as it is, to, for the federal government to be nationalizing things, to get in bed, uh, to own a piece of companies, that it, which it has bailed out. Now, uh, that's on the fiscal side, not the monetary policy side. Now, as far as the Fed goes, I, I mean, they're the de facto uh, backstop for, for the financial industries. Will they en end up being the financial the de facto backstop for other kinds of industries, I don't know. I, I do think that the U.S. Fed will begin buying equities. I think they'll just start buying stocks uh, and part, and become a more a, an even more active participant in markets. The Bank of Japan buys stocks. The Swiss National Bank buys stocks. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly not far-fetched two years hence, five years hence, to think that on the Fed's balance sheet will be FANG stocks like Apple or... Uh, Google or something to say, well, you know, they're so important to the U.S. economy 
into our national security, into employment that we that we we can't let them crash. I mean, those stocks are doing fine at the moment, but it, it's certainly not inconceivable. And I think uh, Janet Yellen has mentioned this in the past. I think we'll hear this drumbeat accelerate uh, for the for the Fed to get involved in the stock market too. So. Um, I, I think what's happening is a form of de facto nationalization of industry. It's not outright, but it's it's uh, circuitously the Fed is, um, as a quasi government agency, is sort of buying the market, and and so that that's a form of nationalization. I think you're right. What are the the implications that for for the first time, first time in history, the Fed is spending billions to purchase corporate bonds, which you pointed out before, and this is perhaps the biggest bubble of all in the economy. That That is very worrying. That's probably more worrying than a housing bubble or even a commercial real estate bubble. Imagine all these poor retailers like The Gap we mentioned and Neiman Marcus and Brooks Brothers. They're going to be, uh, I'd hate to be uh, owning a lot of REITs in Manhattan right now. Um, yeah, I do think the corporate bond bubble may be the single biggest of all. There's a, a Spanish economist named Daniel Lacalle, L-A-C-A-L-L-E, who writes a lot of great stuff about this. And because he's in Europe, he's been keeping an eye on the negative rate uh, corporate bond debt and also the negative rate sovereign bond debt. And there's a huge interest rate risk here. I, I mean, in in deflationary crashes in the past, Interest rates have risen, at least in you know after a period, not necessarily right away, but after a period. And so uh, the the chances for huge corporate bond losses, if interest rates just went from negative two up to one or two positive, I mean, are just absolutely enormous. And that that's kind of a a ticking time bomb out there. It, it feels a lot like 2008 when there was a huge amount of mortgage-backed debt. You know, Jeff, with the the Fed's balance sheet north of north of six trillion, another all time record, can you see an end? How much credit is enough for the Fed to stop injecting liquidity into the economy? I don't know because it's there's a huge psychology here. Um, I, I think it'll go to ten trillion. I have no, there's no doubt in my mind the Fed's balance sheet will go to 10 trillion and that they'll they'll do that without hesitation because the bigger the numbers get the more meaningless they get. Um nobody understands the national debt anymore. Nobody understands the Fed's balance sheet because it's too big to understand. And you know people like me have been crying uh have been chicken littles for so long talking about debt or talking about the Fed's balance sheet, the people just start to tune us out and say, well, you know, you were saying that in 2000, you were saying that in 2010, and nothing too, too bad seems to happen. So let's just keep doing that. <laughs> and and that's fair enough. I mean, there that's the Keynesian argument that at some point, maybe we'll die before the, the bad effects are felt and we'll get away with it. Um, and, you know, when I say get away with it, I mean, using fiscal or monetary policy to create wealth out of thin air. That's what I mean by get away with it. And we all know that that can't last forever. We all know that you can't fix a spendthrift's spending problem by just giving him or her more and more debt and increasing their, their credit limit. At some point, it has to be paid. And, what, and the question just becomes, how many generations down the line are we going to, to, to you know, foist off this payment? I don't know the answer to that. I, I I do think there's a point where the rest of the world looks at the United States and says, you know, pretty soon we're going to have maybe three trillion in tax revenue at the federal level and a four trillion dollar deficit. So Congress will spend seven trillion dollars maybe in 2021, let's say, and bring in less than half of that in taxes. OK, we could have an annual single year deficit that is larger than tax receipts. We, so, Patrick, when the rest of the world looks at that and says, OK, this is a crazy, drunken spendthrift who is never going to get his fiscal house in order. Why am I lending this crazy person 10-year debt at less than 1% interest? I should be lending this crazy person debt at junk bond rates, 18% or 20% because of the risk. And so there is going to come a day when Nobody is that interested in U.S. Treasury debt anymore, especially if that goes negative, which 
it may. I, I don't know that, but it may. It's close. I mean, it's 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 less than one percent on a ten year right now, and with inflation, that's certainly negative in real terms. So, you know, when will people simply stop lending Uncle Sam money, and when will the Fed go from being the, sort of the buyer of last resort, the implicit backstop for Treasury debt, to the to the number one primary buyer? You know, right now we still have a lot of hedge funds. We have a lot of pension funds. We have governments like China and Japan, governments all over the world who will still buy U.S. Treasury debt. Sometimes they're even required to. Uh, you know, like with a, uh, you know, a big uh, pension fund from uh, an organization like Harvard that has billions and billions of dollars, they're required to hold a certain pen, a percentage in treasuries. So there's a kind of an artificial market there. Uh, and for the moment, U.S. Treasuries still pay more than a lot of euro debt, European sovereign debt. So, you know, it's still still a, less of a loss. Uh, I, I'm not smart enough to know when that day comes, when the world finally shrugs. And by the world, I mean the Social Security Trust Fund, U.S. investors, too, not just the rest of the world, just shrugs and says, no mas. You know, we're, this is this is no longer a viable, safe asset to hold. At less than one percent, uh, and and that's going to be a scary day, you know. Maybe they can. Maybe that's ten trillion worth of, of Fed balance sheet. I I, I don't know. Um, I think I you know we can only look at first principles. We can't look at timing, and say that this is very 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 uh, uh, unstable. This can't last. And we, you know, use that knowledge to inform our actions as individuals and try to seek out money uh, and investments which are real and not uh, not just hot air. So that's that's my personal approach. And and uh, if I had a if I had some sort of specialized knowledge, uh, which, you, you know, about when <laughs> about the limits of the Fed's balance sheet, I think I'd be trying to apply that to my personal investing. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Uh, Two 200- hundred trillion fiscal gap in social security and and why it's a recipe for for disaster so this 200 trillion figure was derived by a couple of economists at princeton one of them's name is lawrence kotlikoff he, he may be uh retired now apologies if he's not but kotlikoff you can look him up it's called the fiscal gap and he and a colleague figured this out and said well if we look at what the U.S. government is likely to owe retirees in terms of promises in the future and what the U.S. government is likely to take in in terms of tax revenue based on our current numbers and, and extrapolating those out with even a, a, some you know, reasonably rosy predictions of economic growth, there's a huge gap. And, and the net present value of that gap using a discounted model that uh, Mr. Kotlikoff, Professor Kotlikoff used came out to $200 trillion with a T. Um, Teeth for so, trouble. <laughs> yeah, that w- that's a very scary number. And I don't know how we deal with that other than raising uh, retirement age and reducing benefits and applying means testing and, and all kinds of things. So a lot of people are relying on a promise. And again, the moral hazard, these, these promises are nowhere to be found on the balance sheet of the U.S. fiscal government. They don't show up in that 20, what is it now, $24 trillion debt figure, because they aren't on the book debts. You don't have, you don't have a legal right to Social Security or Medicare. If you die before you become eligible at 65, it, you're, you know, everything you paid into it just vanishes. That's it. Um, now, there can be a spousal survivor benefit, but for the most part, it just vanishes. So, so it's not a debt in the same sense as a, a U.S. Treasury debt is. It's a promise. It's it's you know it's an entitlement which you can you know you know have or not have but politically speaking it's like a debt I mean people are counting on it and any politician who runs uh, you know federal politician who runs on a platform of even touching much less getting rid of Social Security and Medicare is immediately dead in the water and out of the running so these are sacrosanct uh, programs and that so so in effect is a political matter. That two hundred trillion probably ought to be residing on the U.S. federal government's balance sheet because it's it's as a political matter it, it is as set in stone as Treasury debt is. Yeah, I hear you. Um, let's go back a little bit in time. Why do you see the uh, 
the Nixon shock of 71 to be the moment where modern monetary policy took root? Yeah, it's, you know, that was the point at which foreign governments or foreign holders of gold could no longer uh, exchange their U.S. dollar notes for gold with the Federal Reserve. So we hadn't been on a gold standard for a long time. Really, World War I in the 1910s was the end of a true gold standard. But in 1971, the sort of the last gasps, the dying breaths of any link between the U.S. dollar and redeemability in gold were extinguished. Uh, Nixon did this unilaterally. He didn't do this via Congress, by the way. Uh, and ever since then, central bankers have, have basically been able to say we can operate the dollar as a, you know, as a policy tool. It's not backed by anything. We never have to make it redeemable in any other uh, store of value. And as a result of that, we can, we can manipulate the supply. We can manipulate interest rates as we see fit. Uh, for the benefit of the economy to pursue our dual mandate of you know low price inflation and low uh, unemployment, uh, and now they have a they have a, an unspoken third mandate, which is prop up equity prices. <laughs> I think that's their overriding mandate. We've seen that in the last twelve years. So that yeah. um, you know keep keep the Goldman Sachs and Treasury Department revolving door happy. Um, but you know once once. The, the central bankers didn't have to even think about gold anymore. They could simply use money supply and interest rate targets. Now, they can't set them. It's not so easy. The economy has its own supply and demand uh, issues, which, are, you know, so monetary policy isn't everything. And um, I'm often accused as someone who who is an advocate of the Austrian school in general, as someone who who thinks, you know, puts too much stock in monetary policy. And really what's moving the economy is other forces. And there, there's some truth to that. Maybe we overstate the, the impact of monetary policy sometimes. But, but when it comes to the dollar side of the equation, and what I mean is whenever you buy a good or service, one, one side of the equation is the quality of the good or service provided. The other side of the equation is the quality of the money paid for that good and service. When we look at the dollar side of that equation in every transaction, um, you have basically a Politburo. You have a, a, a Soviet-style Politburo of people called the Federal Open Market Committee uh, sitting around deciding uh, how to manipulate the, the dollar and interest rates. I don't call that capitalism. I don't call that markets. And now when we have a crisis, as we had in 2008, we had some in the 90s before that. We had one in 2000. We had one in 2008. Now we're having a bad one in 2020. Uh, central bankers have no limits in their ability to create this crazy, undefinable thing they keep calling liquidity, which is really more uh, bank reserves and and uh, reserves for other assets. Now, uh, you know, they're buying all kinds of things. So it's uh, it's an experiment. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it'll work. It's hard to say that you know human history is unfolding, but. I don't think it's going to work forever. Excuse me, Jeff, if the Nixon shock of 71 had not happened and let's say fiat currencies were still backed or, or linked to gold, would we have escaped the economic problems that we have today? Well, I think we would have had uh, less, fewer systemic problems. We probably would have had lower growth during some of those years because I think GDP is a ginned up statistic. Uh, which, for one thing, counts government spending and fiscal and monetary stimulus create all kinds of spending, both on the government side and the private sector side, which probably wouldn't happen without interest rates that low and credit that widely available. So in a sense, uh, central bank policy since 71 has created growth in, in, in the nominal GDP measurement of the term. I just don't think that growth is real. I think it's ersatz. And I think, it, I think we see that today when after all these years of growth and this great recovery, now not double digit GDP growth, by the way, but single digit growth since the so-called uh, recovery uh, since 2008. But yet, why are so many businesses this close to the bone? Why are so many households don't even have 500 bucks? They need that $1,200. Why is the gap not paying rent? Uh, why do airlines who spent billions of dollars buying back their own stock 
over the last couple of years when oil prices, the single biggest cost, well, the second after, I guess, aircraft, the second single biggest cost, uh, the second biggest cost, sorry, uh, for airlines when, when, you know, oil prices have been very favorable for airlines. Why do airlines not have enough cash, work, you know, working capital to keep operating without a bailout from Uncle Sam? Where is all this growth and health in the economy since 2008 that we've been sold? I would argue that it was a little fake, uh, you know, somewhat fake and somewhat engineered by uh, low interest rates, e easy liquidity and expansionary monetary policy. So if, if we had had some link still to gold or, or other commodity backing since 1971, I think the Fed would not have been able to uh, inflate nearly as much as Alan Greenspan did in the 80s. Uh, I don't think he would have been able to engineer the, the so-called Greenspan put after 1987, which he applied again in the stock market crash of 2000. I don't think Bernanke and Yellen would have been able to be as expansionary as they were. Um, it, it's hard to say, but you know, politically speaking, there's not a lot of support for any fiscal or monetary policy checks. I think the political class is very happy to have the Fed monetizing its debts so that it can give the voters all these freebies and not have to pay for it with painful taxes. Yeah. Um, so there's a very unholy relationship between the political class and the central banking class. And right now they're scratching each other's backs in a, a way that just is almost unthinkable. And, and I'm convinced that it's going to lead to monetary ruin and that we ought to be thinking real hard about trying to build an economy or rebuild an economy that's not based on smoke and mirrors, but is based on, uh, on uh, you know, real growth and productivity, not, you know, steroid juiced growth and productivity because central banks are nice to us. Yeah. So I guess some of the... Um... <clears throat> Some are those are some of the reasons why why you you like you like gold, I guess, right? Sure, I like gold. Uh, gold is has done unbelievably well for five thousand years or more. Uh, it has always been accepted as money during that period. Uh, it has never gone to zero relative to other goods and services or other currencies. Uh, it has retained value across geography. Uh, across political governments, across time. Uh, that's an amazing feat uh, that for any technology. Gold was a technology for its day. Uh, the idea that instead of bartering with each other, which is very, very difficult, we're going to have this shiny metal <laughs> uh, and, and give that to each other so that I can get some of your chickens and you can get some of my blacksmithing services. That was a technological advance at the time. Now, uh, there's lots of ways now that we could use gold as a backstop, but still apply modern digital technology and have that, you know, we don't need to move physical gold around, which has, an, you know, obviously a big cost, both in terms of shipping and ensuring that movement. We don't need to move physical gold around. We could have uh, clearing houses and warehouses private, you know, that would be my preference, not governmental or central banks, but private around the world uh, where they could act as custodians. And uh, levering on top of that, hopefully not with with uh, fiduciary media or fiat, but you know we could we could trade and exchange uh, all kinds of what we might call currencies that are backed by that gold privately. Those could you know simply be accomplished on a debit card, um, and your account you know you could you could buy more gold, add to your account in a, a vault somewhere, just like you buy, just like you add your paycheck, deposit that in your local bank. So there's there's no reason that gold has to be a hindrance because it's not digital, uh, because it's not, uh, you know, it's not you have to melt it down or it's heavy or you can't carry it around the world. You need different weights and sizes for payment. It's always fluctuating versus goods and services. None of that is a problem in the digital age because you can simply have the gold sitting somewhere, uh, redeemable, in, but, you know, mostly just sitting and then people could be uh, working on top of that with all kinds of digital currencies or digital payment systems. I mean, really, the marketplace would be amazing there. And some organizations uh, like Gold Money and Peter Schiff have, have attempted to do things like this. And of course, uh, Bitcoin, in effect, attempts to do something like this, but without the underlying requirement for gold. And the question with Bitcoin becomes, do you believe it has underlying value? Do you believe the technology itself? Uh, and the simply the hardness of Bitcoin, the hard stop 
on its growth to where you're going to have, you know, a, a stock to flow ratio that's going to be, uh, you, you know, fixed uh, at some point. Um, is, is all of that technology and, and uh, the, you know, what Bitcoin represents, is that a value unto itself? Is that a commodity of sorts? Um, I, I don't know. You know, that's not for me to say. That's for the marketplace to say. Is, is Bitcoin money? Uh, I hope it is. I, you know, but that's for the market to say. But the idea that we, we, we need these central banks to give us the ability to have money, especially central banks untethered to any limitations on what they do, uh, is just it, it's crazy. It's unsustainable. Uh, it's fraught with political intrigue. And, I, you know, I don't want my money political. Last question, Jeff. You liken the, uh, the U.S. economy to that of a fragile and infirmed sick patient. What would be the medication this patient needs to take now to get well, economically speaking? Well, first, we need an awful lot of bankruptcy and restructuring in the economy. There are a lot of sick old men companies out there, and they need to go away. They need to to not be bailed out. And I'll you know I'll include airlines. I'll, I'll include whatever it is. And and all of that, uh, all this bankruptcy and insolvency must be allowed to take place. And that would cause real pain for America. Uh, unemployment hardship. I I'm not saying this glibly. I'm not saying this. Like I, you know, not affected. I would be affected. Um, I don't mean, you know, I'm not saying this to sound like a smarty pants. This is not a pleasant thing. But uh, they, these companies have to be allowed to go bankrupt. Their assets have to be sold off to new, to new owners at new mark to market rates, realistic rates, and they need to begin to rebuild themselves uh, or rebrand these assets or whatever it takes, and and create an economy that is not just based on the hot air of either fiscal or monetary stimulus, an economy that's really based on uh, companies that are valued correctly and that can go out there and, and begin the painful road back to productivity and sales and growth. There's no shortcut. And, that, and, and businesses and individuals have to get used to the idea of saving more and spending less. Again, painful, that has a drag on the economy. Um, to build up more capital, to make themselves less vulnerable, less susceptible to these kinds of uh, meltdowns. Businesses have to grow more working capital. Um, if central banks would get the hell out of the way and let interest rates rise, uh, both businesses and individuals would not feel like such suckers or chumps for having a, a lot of liquid cash for which they're paid 1%. I mean, people ought to get 5 or 7 or 8% on cash holdings. And not have to be venturing out into the stock or bond markets to to gin up uh, any kind of return. Uh, so you know it really requires central banks to let interest rates rise, and it requires a lot of pain on the individual and private sector side to to try to rebuild. Um, but that's that's what um, a healthy economy and healthy society would begin doing. Jeff Dice, before we wrap up. Can you let our listeners know more about your work and also the mission of the Mises Institute? Well, yeah, right now it feels like our mission is to <laughs> is to try to get people opposing the shutdown and get people worried about what central banks and central governments are doing. That's, I guess that's our immediate mission. Our longer term mission is to promote what I would consider sane or correct economics. And we do that with a lot of free stuff on our website. We have a, a ton of free books and downloads and and daily articles. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Mises, M-I-S-E-S. -E you can follow me on Twitter at Jeff Deist, all one word. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate your and any interest your listeners might have in, in learning more uh, about economics because, you know, economic ignorance, I think, is at the root of the public's complicity in what's been going on, both with the shutdown and on the governmental side. Yeah, it's a good point, Jeff. Um, but we appreciate the, the time you've given us, and we'll be sure to, to send people your way. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. That was Jeff Dice, president of the Mises Institute, sharing with us about Austrian economics and the Mises Institute. To find out more about the Mises Institute, please visit the website, Mises.org. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content, and do also check out the SBTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify.